uh, wrap up our budget issues with this last question, which is simply, um, Chris, starting with you, name three budget items you would cut and why. Three budget items. I'll tell you, it comes down to positions and people. You know, I, I do not believe that this year we need to be looking at investing more money and more capital infrastructure into buying more, more sheriffs, deputies, police cars. I do not believe that we need to spend more money investing in, in what I think and what I think the county taxpayer will agree are needless budget investments. So to identify three, we can probably identify a hundred. But to go to the question, we need to change the culture and make it a culture of success in Kitsap County. So I think we must identify these budgets working with the elected officials and the department heads. I certainly don't think that we should uh, cut, cut randomly throughout the budget process. Thank you. To give you three specific examples of things that I would consider cutting in the 2012 budget. One, as we mentioned before, barring any other some kind of justifications that would be looking at animal control and the Kitsap Immune Society. And I think we also can no longer afford to fund the rodeo purse. Uh, we've been contributing $40,000 or more over the past several years um, to the, the Stampede Rodeo as a, a basically winnings for those individuals who participate. I don't think we have the ability to do that any longer. And I also agree that we need to look at our ERNR, our equipment replacement and reserves, because we haven't been funding that for the past couple of years. Part of our 2.2 projected million dollar gap that we're looking at closing for 2012 is the fact that we are looking to try to refund and do some of those to the tune of about 1.2 million. I don't think we can afford to do all of that in 2012. Thank you. All right, so time to change the subject line a little bit. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's look at it then maybe into a less controversial subject, such as the, uh, I know, the uh, rifle and revolver range. <laughs> okay, so the, um, the rifle and revolver range has never had a county ordinance required for operation nor a safety violation in decades. Why is there a need for one now? I believe that goes to Or you, you ended last. I ended last, yeah. Please. So I think what we're, I want to distinguish the fact that we're talking about the proposed ordinance changes and not the current litigation that's out there, because I really can't speak to the litigation piece. But what that did do when that case came up, it identified some gaps that we have in our gun range ordinances. Basically, where changes can happen pretty much unchecked, and it was only designed for, as it was written currently, and it's been quite a while since the early 90s that it was originally or last reviewed, it only applied to new gun ranges. It doesn't apply to individuals that currently operate. So it's trying to find, come into alignment, make sure that we have one ordinance that treats everyone completely, fairly. And I think. Often the, the, the charge is the fact that we're trying to put gun ranges out of business, and that is definitely not it. We are trying to be responsive to the community, their needs for safety and their concerns, and try to find that balance. Thank you. Chris? Well, thank you. You know, I don't know how you can say you're not trying to put gun ranges out of business when one noise compliance or a new ordinance could facilitate a shutdown of that gun range. These organizations have been operating safely and responsibly for more than decades, in some cases 50 and 60 years. And to, re to change the regulation and the zoning at this time is simply irresponsible. It's irresponsible because if we do not have a place where we can conduct this, where people can go and learn firearm safety in the county and, and safely fire a weapon, a, a, a pistol or a rifle, then, then what you're saying is you're creating a, a difficult situation and a hostile, potentially hostile environment for Kitsap County. So I don't think that we're being responsive to the needs of, of the community by trying to shut down and re-regulate these gun clubs. All right, so now let's uh, move from rifle ranges to the coast, or to the coastline, shall we? And the question is for streams. Chris, what is your position on a buffer for shoreline 50 feet or 100 feet or 150 feet back from streams? Well, thank you. You know, I think at this point, we need to remember that these, this is people's property, a private property. I think 50 feet is, is, is accessible and is, is reasonable. I think we must consider that updating these master plans and updating these environmental changes 
is not necessary. I think, quite frankly, that we have a system that works and it's not broken. I think the county's land use policies over the last 20 years were much more effective than what we're proposing to do now. And it concerns me over these arbitrary changes and uh, the lack of defensible science to justify these buffers. So, you know, when we talk about streams, when we talk about shoreline, we need to remember these are property owners' properties. In most cases, most people have most of their assets tied up in their property. We need to protect their property as well as protect the community's property. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with Chris more. Um, I think ultimately our responsibility is to be responsive and respectful of the property owner's rights. And in the same time we're balancing through the Growth Management Act, our accountability and our responsibility to have not only a critical areas ordinance, which currently governs, governs all of the setbacks, but through a process of having the Shoreline Master Program update by the end of next year. And that is a challenge. And we've been hearing from a lot of wonderful citizens, and I've been out there knocking on their doors and having this conversation with them, that they are concerned about how the, the ordinances will be actually be structured. And to say, let them know that nothing has been put into place. The county has actually created one of the most transparent processes of any jurisdiction around the county, or around the state, where basically we're only required to update it and have two hearings with the commission, uh, planning commission and the board, and yet we've involved a panel of citizens to get involved and make it the best thing it possibly be. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the partnership questions. We're running quick, uh, low on time here. And um, so this question is, uh, is what is, uh, for starting with Rob, what is your position on Rolling Hills Golf Course? The question is, does government belong in the golf course business? Well, currently, uh, county government is in the parks and recreation business, and the Rolling Hills Golf Course was actually something that the county did not have to, to purchase. It actually it was a nice win-win type of situation where you had a property owner who wanted to find a way of funding some good work in the community over the next couple of decades, at the same time as transferring the property ultimately to the county and therefore it will actually, in the long term, be a revenue generator to actually support the parks and recs facilities. And we currently have a, a golf course already. And I think the county has far too many golf courses. I don't think it's a responsibility or the role of county government to be in the recreational business. I do not think that it was responsible of our county commissioners to accept this tax liability, or the liabilities by bringing the Rolling Hills golf course off the tax rolls. You know, we no longer are now generating revenue. We might generate revenue in the future, but we don't know when that's going to be. And in this difficult economy, I think it's completely irresponsible that our commissioners had allowed that to happen and agreed to do this private, for-profit uh, government uh, transaction. Okay, thank you. So moving on to another question about uh, government and private business partnership. The question is, how will you work with car dealerships to bring more electric vehicle charge stations to Kitsap County. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was thinking about courtesy Ford this day, and I'm trying, trying you know, I, I, I think that the function of my, my role will be this. I'm gonna focus on making sure the budget is sustainable, making sure that we have common sense land use and open and transparent land use. Going back to a couple of questions, I don't think we have transparency the Shoreline Master Program. We have a system in place where the county actively, actively circumvents the will of the voters, circumvents the will of the stakeholders, and is putting the county's 7,000 shoreline property homeowners in a difficult situation. By declaring these non-conforming issues in Kitsap County, by saying these homes no longer conform to what we want, and we're not going to offer you a favorable grandfather clause for the Shoreline Master Program, we're disenfranchising 7,000 people from their homes potentially. Once you have that, that description on there, once you have a non-conforming use on your property, you cannot continue to get permits to build or expand your property. And it's difficult at best to have financing to buy, to refinance, or to reverse mortgage property. So no, I do not believe the county's been transparent at all in shoreline property management. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll do my best to actually answer that question. Um, we actually, yesterday, was the groundbreaking ribbon cutting for two EV charging stations in the city of Port Orchard. I think we have an opportunity right now, there is a federal program and a grant that exists where we can actually have these charging stations 
And all they need to do is be sponsored by other municipalities and parking areas, et cetera, throughout the county. If we had more of those installed in North Kitsap, Central Kitsap, et cetera, it then provides that opportunity such that the, that electric vehicle becomes a much more viable transportation alternative in our community. Very good. So the next question is, what is your position on government involvement in providing internet service, PUD, broadband, broad broad et cetera? I'm sorry, that goes wrong. I think that uh, in partnership, actually, with KPUD, uh, we, the county is not a, a purveyor or, or reseller of fiber optics or any of that. But what we have is the opportunity to work with our local utility districts to make sure that we have uh, the, basically a fiber backbone that is far reaching throughout our communities, whether you're in a, an urban area or in a rural uh, area, you need to now to have the ability to actually have access to high speed internet access. So I, th I think it's a viable thing, but it's something that the county would do in partnership with the PUD. Well, well, to answer the question, you know, we have one utility district in Kitsap County, and that is certainly in their RCWs, what they're allowed to do with their structure and their, their, their government. But as far as the county's involvement, there's almost limited partnership because KPUD on its own accord is providing this service to Kitsap County and to the taxpayers of Kitsap County. But going back to a question we had before, I want to say electric cars. The problem we have in Kitsap County is this. We will not address the full core failures of the budget process. We will not address shoreline master program issues. We will not address land use issues. We'll talk about electric cars and charge stations. I think that question is not nearly as important as our land use and our core services we're providing to taxpayers. All right, so then on to our last question, which has to do with, uh, the question is, the kids of County, <coughs> along with King, Sonomish, Pierce, belong to the uh, Puget Sound Regional Council. This council, through their vision 2040 and transportation 2040 documents, dictates land use and transportation policies for the region. Do you support continued membership in the Puget Sound Regional Council? Uh, or, or would you rather see Kitsap County withdraw and have local control over these decisions like Thurston County? Well, thank you. You know, Kitsap County is part of this Puget Sound Regional Board Aid Council. And some of the concerns I do have is it's a Seattle-based organization which Kitsap receives 5% of the total vote. And not nearly 5% of the total money. The concept of a PSRC is that it's a federal funnel. So federal tax dollars come through the PSRC to help with regional planning, such as property use and transportation. And right now, we receive 5% of the vote and less than 4.5% of the money. It's not right for Kitsap County. It's not right to have people in Seattle dictate what we can do with our shoreline buffers, what we can do with our transportation infrastructure. We need to think about stepping aside from PSRC. Now, I was speaking with John Spellman, who helped create the Metropolitan Planning Organization this weekend. And he told me in our discussions that this is absolutely wrong for kids to have to be a member of PSRC. Because if you receive 5% of the vote and almost no significant source of revenue from it, you're giving away your rights, our rights, to Seattle. Thank you. Thank you. When it comes to participation in the Puget Sound Regional Council, it, I think, is still an important table to be at. And that, the reason why I say that is because at that place, it's all about regional planning. And I don't think, because most, a large number of our citizens continue to uh, commute to the other side of the water for their employment and their livelihood, as opposed to commuting to Jefferson County or Clallam County, we need to make sure that we continue to be at that table so that we have a voice and that we are able to actually receive some of that leverage because you're part of a larger group you have the greater ability to leverage dollars from the federal government and have that funnel into our community even just last year there was well over between six and ten million dollars different road projects that were being supported throughout our local community that we wouldn't have had if we weren't at that table thank you so now we've gotten to the point where we've come to the conclusion of our session and we'll, each candidate will have two minutes to give a summary. Before I do that, I want to, who do we have for next week's uh, guests? Uh, hopefully the school board. School board, where hopefully we'll have candidates for the uh, Pemberton School Board will be here next week. So we welcome and invite you to join us. So for concluding remarks, uh, we started off with Chris, let us 
end with Rob, you may start, please. Just want to have the opportunity. I think that when we talk about electric cars, we talk about shoreline master plan, all of those types of things, these, all of these issues are happening and the government is involved with all the time. You can't just pick and choose what you want to deal with. I think you need to be able to address the current issues that are facing our community while also looking into the future. And electric vehicles and making sure that we have a strong infrastructure throughout our county so that we have good commerce and can help support business development is key. So I just want to make sure that I do that, uh, leave you with that message. Uh, I again thank you for your time this morning and your involvement in our community and for the wonderful questions. I think it, this is one example of how we make this process better because we actually continue to open that dialogue. Again, my Rob, name is Robert Gelder and I have the privilege and honor of serving as your county commissioner since March. I have over 20 years of business experience with over 15 years working with complex organizations not unlike Kitsap County. I do believe in integrity, commitment, and service, and my priorities include the efficient and effective government in this new economy we need to have and successfully usher through a paradigm change. But I also believe in maintaining Kitsap's quality of life while supporting the vitality of businesses advocating for our most vulnerable and even making those difficult decisions about placing a levy on the ballot so that every citizen has the right to make that choice for themselves. And I ask for your support and continued to be, to continue my service to you as County Commissioner. And thank you again for this morning and your questions and I look forward to many conversations in the future. Thank you. And I would like to certainly thank all of you for coming out today and I, I think we have significant issues ahead of us in Kitsap County and we cannot continue to postpone them or put them off. I think issues like the electric car are, are relevant, but I think you don't cherry pick issues in Kitsap County. You know, we have to focus on core spending priorities and we have to focus on what level of service we provide to the residents and the citizens of Kitsap County. Seventy percent of Kitsap County's residents lives in unincorporated Kitsap County. Seventy percent. That means that the thirty percent that chooses to live in the cities are served with local services from the cities, but that 70% still pays taxes, and we need to provide reasonable and reliable local services, and we don't do that by giving our authority away to King County, using King County to dictate our policies on transportation and land use policies. We do not have that. We do not receive that local control when we have our heavy reliance on directors of our departments and rely on them and their abilities as opposed to upsetting policies. You know, in Kitsap County, for the last 10 years, we've had an issue where our commissioners routinely allow the directors of individual departments to really set the policies for their departments. We need to think outside that box. We need to say no. The board of commissioners sets the policy. And if you're not wondering why that is, or you want to see the ramifications of that, look at the county budget and look at the county's governance. You know, we never needed a county administrator, but for 10 years we have one. I think too often our commissioners want to hire and hire away their authority and their rights. They want to step up and say, you make land use decisions because we don't want to be part of the land use decision process anymore. You make budget decisions because we want to step back from that. We cannot continue to do that. And if we do, we will devastate the county economy. My name is Chris Tibbs. I ask for your support. I ask for your vote. I ask for your consideration this year because I believe we can make Kitsap County and continue to have Kitsap County be a beautiful and wonderful place. Thank you so much.